welcome to the Beltway Broadcast, the premier podcast for the workplace learning and talent development professionals of the Association for Talent Development's Metro DC chapter. We've got some great resources in store for you today. Hello, fellow ATDers. I'm Stephanie Hupka, the 2023 Vice President of Membership and a Chapter Past President here at the Metro DC Chapter of ATD. Hi, I'm Christina Eanes, the 2023 Vice President of Marketing Communications and also a Chapter Past President. And we also have Helena Hodges, our Vice President of Finance and Operations, as our producer. And for this episode, we are joined by Cindy Huggett. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to be here. And I feel like I should say I'm a past ATD chapter president here Yay, in the research yeah. travel area, though. That, well, like you should say that. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, we are huge fans, obviously, of chapter volunteering and yes. chapter leadership. And it's probably one of the best ways to experience ATD, I at agree. least in my opinion. I Glad agree. you're part of that club. Well, <laughs> you know, let's, before we even get into today's topic, and I am excited, I am so excited about this one. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself sure. um, for, so all our listeners can get to know you too? Well, thank you for that opportunity. I am Cindy Huggett, and I'm joining you today from my office in Raleigh, North Carolina, although I work with clients around the globe. And I've been in and around workplace learning, are you ready for this, over 30 years. But for the past for 20 years, I have been doing virtual training and virtual learning. I fell into it accidentally at the very beginning, right when virtual classrooms were first coming out. And I thought I would be an HR and training consultant, and I kept getting asked about virtual. So almost the rest is history. In 2014, I started my consulting business. Now, let me correct that. In 2014. 2004, not 2014, 2004. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's a big difference. Uh, I started my consulting business and uh, I help organizations move to the virtual classroom, implement virtual training along with hybrid learning and other forms of uh, facilitator led programs. Mm -hmm. Well, I am so happy that you are with us for today's topic. And I would bet that in some ways you probably had a little bit of an easier time with the last couple of years than others. But hearing a little bit about, about your background, it sounds like you probably were a big part of organizations moving into hybrid learning, which is what we're going to be chatting about today. So I think as we get started with our conversation, one thing I would love to hear from you is how you define hybrid learning learning. And the reason I ask that is because in chatting with colleagues and clients, I hear a lot of different definitions. Yeah. And I'm wondering when it comes to this space, how you define it or what that looks like for you. It's a huge problem that we have in our mm. industry because we are in many cases saying the word hybrid, but one person is thinking apples and somebody else is thinking oranges. We mm -hmm. just don't have consistent terminology. And here's the reason for it. If you look in the K through 12 or the university college settings, hybrid refers to what we would call a blended program where you have almost like a college course, uh, meeting with a professor once a week, and then you do small group or self-led assignments in between. We in corporate learning, workplace learning, the talent development industry, we call that blended. And to us, a hybrid program for most people in organizations around the globe, hybrid means a synchronous event, a facilitated event that has some participants together and some participants who are connecting remote. Maybe they're working from home, they're at another location of the company, they're on the road or on the go. Now, it's actually not that simple when we think of it because mm -hmm. Let's say we're taking the definition that I use that most of us in workplace learning refer to the synchronous event with multiple audiences. There are several different categories that fit that description, but are still considered hybrid. So the most common is, let's say we have a training program with 20 participants. 10 of them might be together in a classroom, 10 of them might be remote, and the facilitator is on site with the in-person. That's kind of the most common. 
but it could also be 10 participants together in New York, 10 participants in Chicago. They just happen to be in two different locations connected by a video conference. That's hybrid as well. Or it could be that the facilitator is remote and most of the participants are together, right? I mean, we could keep um, delineating out different types, but it's so important for us to stop and think when we're talking about hybrid learning, what do we mean by that? And what does your organization mean by that? And how are you going to refer to it moving forward? So first place to start. I love that. Now, I, I've done hybrid speeches before, presentations, mm -hmm. right, where you have audiences in multiple areas attending either remotely or, like you said, there's an audience in person. But with learning, right, a facilitation mm -hmm. where it needs to be a lot more questions and activities and, and that kind of thing, um, it kind of baffles me on the hybrid learning area. So can you first, can we level set by going over maybe some benefits to hybrid learning as we've defined it, as well as maybe some setbacks or sure. things we need to consider. Sure. And maybe I should say as a disclaimer first, I wrote about hybrid learning in a book I wrote back in 2016. My brand new book is about hybrid learning as well as other types of learning environments. And I have said all along, if you can avoid doing hybrid, Avoid it. Don't don't do it unless you have to. And and we yeah. laugh about that. But the the challenge of hybrid before we talk about the benefits, the challenge, as most people are aware, is it's a different experience if you're yes. in person versus remote. It's not equitable. The in-person participants have the benefit of seeing each other face to face. The remote participants have these great tools like polling or chatting or online whiteboards. And so we think about the benefits of both, but also that creates a challenge because if in a training program, you need people to role play, well, you've got two different tool sets, two different ways of communicating, two different methods for making that happen. So the benefit of doing it is we're accommodating for whatever reason, people who cannot travel to come together. Now, yeah. when I say don't do it, I'm actually not as, as flippant perhaps as that sounds because the recommendation is, let's say you have this fantastic training program. If your organization has the resources to build an in-person version and a parallel online version of that program. And you would yeah. slot in those participants who wanted to take whichever version. As long as the learning outcomes, the learning objectives, the activities are essentially the same, you're going to get the same results. It's where we shortchange one or the other that, that challenges come in. So if you can do that, do that. So many learning professionals that were like, I can't do that. I don't have the resources or I need to be accommodating to those remote attendees. And, and so if we're going to do that, let's do it well. Benefit, yeah. inclusion, allowing those who wouldn't otherwise able to be get the training to get the learning experience. Nice. I really appreciate your honesty yes. <laughs> in that answer too. I've spoken with a lot of people who have said that they've been tasked with hybrid. Yeah. And a lot of times that conversation leads to why? <laughs> who tasked you with that? And sometimes it's because somewhere out there is an executive who's heard about this term and it's trendy yeah. and you want to stay on the cutting edge and that makes sense. And I think that the rationale you provided to around accessibility mm -hmm. is essential. Mm -hmm. If you can offer hybrid in order to make your training more accessible, it's a wonderful business case for that. But now I'm thinking if you do find yourself in the position where you are going to be developing hybrid learning, I'm thinking more about the instructional design part of this, planning for those experiences. That can be really tough to do. And just for the reasons that you mentioned, I'd love to know if you have any thoughts or tips that we should keep in mind as we are building those experiences and planning for them. Most definitely. And <laughs> right, probably way more than we have time to talk about in this short conversation. <laughs> they can get the book, right? Here's, <laughs> here's, here's some highlights. Here's some highlights. Number yeah. one, we think about the technology and how technology can be an equalizer. So many vendors right now are creating 
hardware kits and components for virtual um, collaboration that are also for hybrid learning. Uh, we think about a room kit, a camera kit, audio, microphones, those sort of things. Many of them are plug and play with the platforms we all know, the platforms that we're all familiar with, and we can use those tools. So think back to in-person traditional classes. You showed up in a boardroom with a big, huge table that you couldn't move and you had all sorts of activities planned. It's so much easier to be in a training room with tables and chairs that you can move if that was your planned program. So when we think about the physical setting of a hybrid class, when we think about the design, you're going to have a much easier time if you have a room, a physical room designated as your hybrid learning classroom that is equipped with the cameras, the microphones, the other things that you need. So that's first of all, think through the technology you need and the technology you have access to. The second part of that, which if you are in an organization that doesn't have this type of room set up for hybrid, you still need to set your room up for hybrid. And my recommendation is that every participant have access to the same tool. So if you're going to use a virtual classroom platform that has polling, collaborative whiteboarding, chatting, raise hand, the standard things, you want everyone to have access to them. So those people in the room would have their device, have their mobile device, have their laptop, just like the remote participants. So therefore, if that's your plan, that's your mandate, that's your requirement for the program, then you can design for that. You still design using the whiteboard or the polling or the other tools for the conversation and collaboration. You can even do breakouts um, and other uh, types of um, collaboration uh, that we have. So uh, as you as you think about the design, much of it is dependent on the technology decisions that you make. The last thing I'll say, which isn't about design, but we should probably talk about it anyways, is it takes a really skilled facilitator, a facilitator yes. who recognizes <laughs> yeah. we need a remote first mentality. We need to focus in on those who are not in the room and also a facilitator who is much more structured. And for some facilitators who like to be very informal, who like to be a little loose, the most successful hybrid learning classes are very structured. It doesn't feel that way necessarily to the participants, but for a facilitator to say something like whatever discussion question it is, click on the raise hand button if you have strong feelings about this. And then you could draw from those raised hands to allow the conversation to happen. Always remote first, but using the tool, the raised hand tool, or acknowledging those in the room, uh, or somebody who is offering a play-by-play -play narrator of what's happening in the room. Something like, mm. well, um, Adam is opening up his laptop right now and getting ready to share. That's why there's a lull on the screen, right? Just that narration yeah. that we wouldn't normally offer in, Ooh, in other like environments. Yeah. So it's design, it's technology, but it's also a really skilled facilitator. Add those together. It can be done. It just takes a lot of groundwork and a lot of preparation. Well, first, I love the remote first mentality. I just love... Uh, me too. Just that thought. Yeah. And then the second one I love is the narration. I mean, I would never have thought of that. So mm -hmm. this is definitely not, for lack of a better term, a one person show, it sounds like. It should not be a one person show. It definitely, yeah. right? It definitely, it requires a village. And if you have, so think about virtual learning where you have a facilitator and a producer, best practice to do mm -hmm. that. Uh, as you move into hybrid, a facilitator, a producer, a uh, remote buddy, let's pair up the remote individuals mm -hmm. with the in-person individuals and have them uh, partner up with each other. Uh, so think through all the different roles. If you don't have access to that in advance, ask your participants to be involved. We want them involved anyway. So let's give yeah. them roles in the hybrid Ooh, learning program. I like that. I'd actually love to hear more about that. So 
As you're chatting with us, I'm thinking a lot about the facilitation mm-hmm. and the preparation, but there's also another part to hybrid learning, and that is being the learner, being mm-hmm. in the room, having that experience. Maybe this is a two-part question. I'm going to ask them both anyway. I would love to hear a little bit from you as far as how people might prepare to experience hybrid. It's a little different than perhaps showing up to a classroom or showing up for a remote-only experience. So I'd love to hear your thoughts more you know, around what that might happen to look like. And I'd also love to hear a little bit about that engagement side. What can we do to make sure that people are engaged, maybe even in a balanced way? Mm-hmm. Great questions. Yeah, they are great questions. <laughs> and let's start with the participant preparation. And as I've yeah. long said about virtual training, just solely virtual training, it's uh, an interactive design it's an engaging facilitator and it's prepared participants. Those three are important. Now with hybrid, we're adding on the technology piece. So it's four uh, pillars that are super important, but the participants are a, a key component. One, to be prepared for learning, but two, to be prepared for learning in the hybrid environment. For those who are in person to have the recognition and acknowledgement that there are additional participants who just don't happen to be physically in the room. It's being considerate and not talking over somebody who might be speaking over a speakerphone, a microphone, uh, or somebody who is not going to have a side conversation. Uh, And we set those, we need to set those guidelines at the start to gain agreement, participant agreement, so important, especially in hybrid and also who's willing to bring in their device, their laptop, their whatever they have, making sure that when they speak, they're speaking to a microphone. Uh, For our remote participants, we need to make sure they're prepared with good solid internet connection, that they're prepared to be on camera, that they're prepared with good audio, that they're able to hear. We wanna do those tech checks in advance. You think by now everyone is familiar with being on a video call, Unfortunately, it is still a challenge for many of us. And I get, I totally get some people, uh, wherever they're connecting from might not have the strongest internet connection. We recognize that, but we often just say, well, I don't have a great internet connection without stopping to think, what are all the things we can do aside from calling our provider? What could we do internally or on our own device to help improve that internet connection? There's so many things that we can do. So having that learning mindset, having the ability to connect, the willingness even at the start to turn on the camera to say hello if it's not on uh, the whole time, If you're thinking, I don't have access to a camera, do you have a mobile device that you can connect, right? I mean, there's so many different creative ways that we can do it. That takes us to the engagement piece. And in a nutshell, I'll I'll say this, and that is if we're going to bring people together at the same time, if at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday, we have a learning event, then it by all means should be designed and delivered and attended as a interactive program, as a program that's full of dialogue, discussion, practice, collaboration. Otherwise, let's send out an email. Let's record a video and let people watch it. Let's do some sort of asynchronous e-learning. But the fact that we're coming together we should have the mindset. It is so rare that our goal is just to bring a one person subject matter expert to lecture. There's a time and a place for that, but that's not hybrid learning. Uh, that's a speech. That's a presentation. Yeah. That's a different, whole different ball game. <laughs> We're here for learning. We're here for practice, that behavior change. I love that. Is Now, is there any, is like you, earlier you were talking about giving them roles. Mm-hmm. Can you share some examples with us? Sure. The note taker role, if there's going to be some sort of scribe or, you know, brainstorming that person who's going to take notes, somebody who, uh, I call them the chat champion. Chat champions will Ooh. encourage conversation. They'll capture key thoughts or keywords. It's different than a note taker. A note taker might be during a particular brainstorm activity, but chat champion, someone who's helping to keep an eye on the chat, especially for remote um, participants. I've had hand raise hall monitors. Uh, some of you might not remember <laughs> having a hall monitor in school. But Do they have safety vests? <laughs> we should give them those. Um, 
having a tech support person, having an in-room partner. I mentioned that remote buddy idea. If you've got 10 participants who are remote, 10 participants who are on site, pair them up so that somebody mm. can send a quick text message. Hey, my internet connection has given me trouble. I'll be right back. Just that private uh, method of conversation, or I didn't hear that, or, or something wasn't clear what's happening. Just to have those lines of conversation mm. open. Now, I hear people ask, well, doesn't that just make things too busy? Doesn't that take away from the learning. And it does depend on the topic and the activities that you have planned. But the more people you can have involved in the success of the program, I think the better. So let's use some of those roles, especially if you're in an organization where you don't have a ton of external support, maybe you're solo facilitating, you've got shared IT resources, you don't have a technical producer, draw your participants and do some advanced nice. testing, advanced setup with them if you can. And if not, build into your program some logistics time. Uh, you can have some networking Smart. going on, but also some logistics time. You know, what I love about that too is it gives people a chance to feel like they have some sense of ownership over the experience, yeah. like they're playing an important role. Yes. And I think we all know, especially with adult learners, they want to feel like they have some ability to control some of this. So yeah. when you put them in a position where they have an opportunity to play a part, to feel like they are helping toward the success of the event, I love what that does for engagement. And at the mm -hmm. same time, likely sets them up to really engage with the content and each other. Most definitely. What great advice. Oh, I love it. Now, I know we just scratched the surface. <laughs> I know we did just the surface level of this stuff. And you recently had a book come out. Can you share just the title and where people can get that if they want to dive further into I this? I did. And it is the Facilitator's Guide to Immersive, Blended, and Hybrid Learning. There it is. And it <laughs> is available through Amazon. It's available on the ATD Press Bookstore, Barnes & Noble, other find retailers where you can find it. And it is a look at the facilitator's role in modern learning environments. There's a chapter on virtual training, blended journeys, hybrid learning, using VR simulations, virtual reality simulations, mm. and a chapter on the facilitator of the future. How do we keep up with all of these technologies? So we'll put a link hopefully in the show notes. So you can always visit my website, cindyhuggett.com to learn more. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, Cindy, at the end of every episode, we like to ask our guest rapid fire style questions. I've noticed that. Are you excited? I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we go. Give us one book that everyone must read and why. As you can see, I love books. They're all behind yes. me. <laughs> if I had to pick just one, I am going to pick the book of Proverbs written by King Solomon Ooh. way long time ago. Don't even know how long oh, ago, yeah. but what a book packed full. It doesn't matter your religious beliefs or not. A book packed full of wisdom for life. Mm -hmm. I think it is a must read for everybody to go through and look at what this king said about living wisely. Wow. Cool. Okay. What is one tool you cannot live without? That would be Any my tool. planner. My planner, I use a planner. I am a planner, but it really is what keeps me organized. I do yearly planning. Every month I revisit it. The beginning of every week I revisit it. And the night before each day, I write out my plan. And I, believe it or not, even though I keep an electronic calendar, I use a written planner for my big picture goals, for mm. keeping track of what I want to accomplish every year, every month, every week, and then uh, shorting that out to each day. I love the plans. Cool. Awesome. I always love to add to the, the toolbox there. Oh, me too. Yeah. Okay. Final question. What is the best piece of advice you have ever been given? 
One time I was on a business trip as a very new professional and we were getting ready to leave the hotel and my colleague was cleaning up the breakfast area. And I was thinking, what are you doing? Because we're in a hotel in a public place. And she said, I've always learned to leave a place better than I found it. Mm. And of course, we've all heard that before, but she put that into practical. It didn't take an extra whatever to clean up the table a little bit more and straighten the chairs, but that has stuck with me. Mm. How can we make a place just a little bit better than we found it? Every conversation, every interaction, I fall short of that, but I remember, and I think it's so important for us, especially today, how can we bring some positivity mm. into this world? Oh. Those little acts of kindness go so much further than many of us think. That is outstanding advice. Cindy, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. This conversation has been the highlight of my week so far. It has been so much fun to pick your brain and learn some really, really helpful tips on hybrid learning from you. Thank you so much for having me. I've loved it as well. Well, we are really glad you're here. And of course, many thanks to all of you in our community for listening today. And before you go, we have a message from our producer, Helena Hodges. Do you need consultant services? The Metro DC chapter of ATD has many talented members. Go to dcatd.org and check out our consultants directory under the resources menu option. Follow the Metro DC chapter of ATD on LinkedIn today.